We all ask questions. Why is the sky blue? What happened to all the dinosaurs? What was the best thing before sliced bread? But some questions are more important than others. How do I forgive someone even when I feel like I can't? What's my purpose in life? How can I be the parent God wants me to be and the one my kids need me to be? So where do we turn? To the one that has all the answers. We'll tackle some of life's most complex issues and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. Well, today we're in week number two of our You Asked For It series. And today we are so honored to have my dear friend, John Maxwell, speaking to us. Most of you already know him as the founder of Equip, a missions organization that we're a part of that is dedicated to training and resourcing leaders all around the world. Others of you know him as America's great leadership guru and have read his great books. But I want you to know that he's much more than that to us. He's been a father, a mentor, a friend to me and to this church. So please receive him as one of our own. Open up your heart to the message he has for you today. So to all of our locations today, please stand and welcome to the stage, John Maxwell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's great to be here with you. It was great to be in worship. Wasn't worship wonderful today? Wow, hello. Do you have worship like this every Sunday? When you go to heaven, you're going to want to come home on the weekends, aren't you, huh? You're going to say, whoa, I just want, I'll come back, but let me just go to Highlands for worship. It is, it's so good to be with you. It's so good to be uh, in this church. I want to thank you. I want to thank you because of, of your commitment to equip uh, the nonprofit organization. This is the largest leadership training organization in the world. We're in 175 countries, trained 6 million leaders, and you are a vital help and support to that. And I just want to thank you because you understand stewardship, you understand giving, you are faithful to this church in tithing, bringing the offerings to this church. And it's through that that, that organizations like ours receive funds. And so because you give here and because you're faithful in tithing uh, to this local body, uh, it really spreads around the world, and, and I want to thank you. And then, of course, I want to just say uh, to my wonderful friend Chris, Tammy, what beautiful people they are. Uh, we've known each other for many, many years, and we've uh, spent a lot of time together. And I know leadership, and I know churches, and, and for 40-plus years now, I've, I've been in churches, large churches around the world in America, and, and I know pastors really well. And I think you know this, but I want to make sure you know this. And, and, and Pastor Chris... You have, without any doubt in my mind, one of the very, 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 very top pastor leaders of any congregation in America. Do you realize that, huh? Beautiful. And, and just uh, uh, loves you, loves you, loves the ministry, loves what's happening. Every time we're together, he just keeps talking about what's happened in the church, and I can't shut him up, you know what I mean? And, it's, and it's, just, it's just absolutely terrific. In fact, when he talked to me a few weeks ago, he called me, and he said, John, you know, could you come over and do some teaching? I said, I'd love to. And, and so I said, how can I serve you? And he said, well, we're doing, we're doing a series called You Asked For It. And so he began to talk to me about this series and how he'd ask you earlier, the staff had asked you to, what would be the message you would like to hear, what would be the subject. And so he went through this whole process of you asked for it and I just listened quietly. When he finished, I said, Chris, I said, I understand that series really well. I said, in 1981, 82, 83, 84, when I pastored in San Diego, I did that series. And he got real quiet and said, what do you mean? I said, yes, I started the You Ask For It series. I said, Rick Warren got it from me. You got it from Rick. It's coming all back around. And, and yes, I will be able to teach that series. I can do that. I, I've had some experience. I've, I, I've done this a few times. And, and so I'm just so happy. Happy to be here with you. Delighted, very excited about what's going to happen in these next few moments. Look at the person you're sitting beside and say to them, you're going to learn something. Go ahead and tell them that. Look right back at him and say, and it's about time. <laughs> In fact, why do you think I brought you there? Huh? Yeah. My eyes have some irritant in them today, and so I look very bad. I almost put a sack on my head, but by a vote of three to four in the back room, they said I could, didn't have to put the sack on my head. So if I look a little old and a little bad today in the eyes, it's just that I'm old and 
bad in the eyes, okay? <laughs> I'm 66, and as I've looked at life, and as I have watched life happen, I've become convinced that there are two challenges that you and I have in life. And if we can accept this challenge and meet this challenge, face it well, life will be very fulfilling to us and it'll be very rewarding to the people around us. And because my topic is purpose today, I want to talk to you about these two challenges. The first challenge is for us to find ourselves. And we find ourselves when we discover our purpose. Nothing is better than for a person created by God in his image with a plan for his or her life to find themselves, find that purpose. It's what makes you solid. It's what makes you secure. It's, it's your mooring. It keeps, you, it keeps you just exactly where you need to be so that you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. To discover your purpose, to find yourself. What a wonderful thing. That's what our subject is about today. But there's a second challenge. Once we find our purpose, discover why we're here, there's a second challenge that we have that we face, and that is to lose ourselves. We are to find ourselves, this isn't it interesting, to lose ourselves. And, and we lose ourselves when our purpose becomes bigger than us. It, it, to find a purpose, how important. But then to take that purpose and place it in a position with people that has eternal factors involved is to lose yourself and to go to another whole level of life and another level of living. Many people never do either in their life. They, they, ne they never find themselves, they never lose themselves. Some people, some people find themselves but they never lose themselves. Very few people find themselves and lose themselves. And the aim of this lesson today is to help us know how to discover our purpose and then how to place that purpose in a position that is so much bigger than us that we can literally lose ourselves in the process. Now this teaching of finding and losing is given to us by Jesus in Mark chapter eight. Then Jesus called the crowd and his disciples to him. If you want to come to me, he told them, you must forget yourself, carry your cross and follow me. For if you want to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for me and the gospel, you will save it. Jesus introduces us to the fact in this lesson, in this teaching, that we can save our life if we lose our life. That if we give ourselves to him to a greater cause, we'll literally find it and lose it. He, he teaches us literally and gives us the foundation of how to do this. So the first question we have to ask ourselves this morning is, is how do we find ourselves? That's challenge number one. And we find ourselves by, when we discover our purpose. This morning as I was preparing my heart for our time together in teaching, I was in my hotel here near here. And I went down early in the, the lobby and, and I got in a little place, kind of in a, an area where I could just kind of be by myself. And, and I began to pour my heart out over the, what I was going to teach. And I was in the passage in Jeremiah 29, one of my favorite scripture verses. And, and, and just really hang with me here on this. God says, I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace, not for evil, to give you hope in your final income. And as I sat in the lobby this morning and I, 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 I began to see these words again as I've read them many, many times, I've quoted them many times, and it hit me that God has thoughts and plans for me. And he not only has thoughts and plans for me, he has thoughts and plans for you. And when, when you, let me put it this way, let me, let me contextualize this. When you woke up this morning, God was thinking about you. Yeah, he was. And, and when he created you in his image, he had plans for you. You're, you're not an accident. We're not here because we just kind of happened to be at the end of an explosion. That, that, that we are here because we are divinely placed here with the thoughts of God. And then it hit me because, you know, when, I, when somebody's kind of like important to me and they, they say something like John, they'll text me or something. They say, boy, John, I've been thinking about you. 
And you say, oh, how nice. Oh, they've been thinking about me. And, and how wonderful it is, especially if somebody maybe that you look up to, they say, I believe in you. I just want you to know I believe in you. I just, I just want you to know I, I, I just believe in you. And then it hit me. God, God's texting you this morning. He, he's texting you and he said, I, I just want you to you know, I've been thinking about you. And I've not only been thinking about you, but I've got plans for you. You talk about building your self-image. You talk about all of a sudden beginning to realize how person of a worth and how valuable you are to God and his sight. He's been, he's been thinking about you. He's got plans for you. I want you to look at your neighbor right now and, and say to them, give them a big old smile and say, hey, God's thinking about you. Go ahead and tell them that, huh? God's thinking about you. Hey, and look at the person in your sibling and, and, and say to them with a big smile, and God has plans for you. Go ahead and tell them. He's got plans for you. Hey, and now look at him and say, and I wish you would figure it out. Huh? Oh, come on. I sure hope today you can pick this up. All right, the question is then how do we find our purpose? If he has a purpose for us, if he has plans for us, if he's been thinking about us, how do we find it? There are two questions we have to ask ourselves to find our purpose in life. And question number one is, what am I passionate about? Passion often is linked with purpose. What I love to do is often what I should do. We have been created within us the capacity to have things that we enjoy greatly. And a lot of times there is a definite relationship between what I am in love with and what I should be doing. We are created and wired in such a way that, that passion and purpose many times comes together. And passion is the great energizer. Once you have passion, you have energy. Once you find your passion, you find your purpose, there is something energetic about it. You have never known a person who was passionate that lacked energy. We talk about high energy people, we talk about low energy people. There's no such thing as like low energy people or high energy people. If you have high energy, you have passion. If you have low energy, you don't have any passion. You know, some people, they're, they're already dead. They haven't made it official yet. <laughs> you just look at them. I, I just want to walk around and do the committal, let them watch and observe the whole process. But passion gives us a great amount of energy. And when we have that passion, there's something about how we love what we're doing and we enjoy what we're doing. And passion energizes us. Now, when I say passion and purpose are linked, that is usually the case. It is not always the case. It is possible to be passionate about something that you're not good at. It's possible to be passionate about something that you're not gifted in. Hello? Let me explain. Have you ever watched the tryouts at an American Idol? <laughs> they grab that mic. Man, aren't they passionate? I mean, they are belting out badness. But I mean, they're building it out. I mean, they are sincere. They are loving it. They just are just, I mean, whoo, they are passionately bad. And every, every, every set in America, people grabbing remotes and hitting mute, mute. And, you know, oh, dear God, shut them up. Help them. Help, help, help me. Help us all. You know, <laughs> heal them. Heal me. You know, strike me with deafness. Do something. Now, you know, strike them with speechlessness. Oh, go on. Just do it. Do it. You, you know, now maybe this doesn't, have you ever thought about this? Every time I see something like this, I always have a question. Every time I, I don't, whenever I see somebody that's just really passionate about something that they're not good at, I, I just always ask myself, where are their friends? <laughs> where, come on, talk to me a moment, huh? Where are their friends? I mean. Don't you think you should just sit down at the table and get a bottle of water and say, my name is John and I'm your friend. I just want you to know. You can't sing. So 
So it's possible. It's possible to be passionate about something that you're not good at. But I know this, if you're passionate, that it will increase your energy. And the second thing that I've discovered about passion is it sets us, it sets us apart. It sets us above the crowd. A person with passion always stands out. The world is such, so full of apathy. It's so full of average. It's so full of whatever. That once you have passion and once you have a, a sense of energy in your life, it, it just sets you apart. It, it distinguishes you. It already gives you what I would call a head start in success in life. I can still remember as a young, very young person, graduated from college, Margaret and I got married two weeks later. Two weeks after that, we went to our first church in southern Indiana, a little place called Hillham. You've not been to Hillham. You've never heard of Hillham. You wouldn't want to go to Hillham. If you went to Hillham, you wouldn't know you were at Hillham. <laughs> Eleven houses, two garages, one country store, a little old church building over 100 years old, roof sag walls, bowed. The week before I went there, the church split. <laughs> what really messed me up is I agreed with the people who left. <laughs> it, 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 it was kind of like, there go my people. There, you know, there go my people. There go my people. The first Sunday I, in my new little church, we had three people. First Sunday. Two of them were Margaret and me. Old lady lived by the church named Maud was the third. Maud, Margaret, and me. That was it. That was it. First Sunday. But oh, I was passionate. I loved that little community. I loved that little church. I loved those farmers. And when my college friends would come out to, to visit Margaret and me for the weekend, when they would pull their car up to our little house, I'd, I'd jump out of the house real quick and I'd jump in their car and say, no, no, before you come to the house, I got to show you my church. I got to show you my church. And, and I'd take them a half mile down the road to the little country church and we'd pull in that little gravel parking lot that had 30, you could put 30 cars in probably at best. And, and, and I would go and I'd open up the front door of the church. I said, this is my church. This is my church. And, and the good news is once you open the front door, they saw the church. All of it, it was there. But I was passionate. And I just loved those people, and I just loved my ministry, and I just loved my calling. And, and, and we just had a handful of people in the beginning, but, but we just started working and working hard. And, and I can remember, I'd been there maybe six, seven months, and, 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 I, did, and I thought, boy, we, we, need to, we need to have a big day. And so in the summer one Sunday morning, I just got up and I said, on the first Sunday of October, we're going to have 300 people in this church. And, and as soon as I said it, I, I, I thought to myself, wow, whoa, ooh, I wasn't planning on that. And I looked at the people and they weren't planning on it either. I mean, they looked at me and they 300 people. These people have never, some of these farmers never saw 300 people. Get, get the picture. I mean, they came up afterwards and said, preacher, we love your passion, but we, 300 people, that's beyond us. We can't do that. I said, will you help me? They said, oh, of course we'll help you. It's just too big of a number. But I mean, we just, we just started asking people to come to church. I mean, and, and in our neighborhood, you had to ask them all. I mean, it's not like you get some of them. You got to get them all. You understand? You got to get them all. And so we just asked people and asked people. And by, by September rolled around, we'd ask people so many times that when people would see me coming or any of our members coming, they'd just hold up their hands and they'd say, I'm coming, I'm coming. Don't, you know, don't ask anymore. I'm coming. I'm going to be there. Finally, the Sunday came and oh, we were ready. We, we, we opened up all the windows. It was a nice day. We had, we had places on the outside because we'd have, we could sit, do 100 in the inside. We cleaned up the basement. We rented a little house beside, put some wiring in there for sound. And it was as good as a country could be back in, 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 in 35, 40 years ago. And so here we are. And, and, and the people came. Oh, we had a crowd. I mean, it was wonderful. Right before I got to preach, our lady leader stood up and said, this is the biggest number we've ever had. This is our record attendance. And people are just off the walls, happy, clappy, cheering. He said, we had 299 today. And I'm sitting there. I, I didn't know the number until I heard it. And first thing I asked myself as a pastor is, why am I the only pastor in America that has honest ushers? <laughs> Where is the creativity? <laughs> now, I'll tell you what passion will do for you. I'm just a kid. I'm 22. I stood right up and I said, 
What's our, what's our goal? They said 300. I said, how do we have? They said 299. I said, we're one short. And that won't do. I'm not preaching till we have 300. So Penny, you come up and lead worship. I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna find the 300th person. I'm gonna bring them here. When we get 300, I'm preaching. I walked off that little platform and I started going down that little, <laughs> little aisleway and those farmers stood up and they were clapping and they were cheering and patting me on the back and said, go get them, preacher, go get them, go get them. And I was so pumped until I walked outside. And I thought, now what am I going to do? I, I got 299 people waiting on me. I looked across the street at the gas station. There was Benny Harris, Sandy Burton. Sandy owned the gas station. Neither one of them ever went to church. Walked across the street. Of course, everybody knew we were trying for 300. And Sandy said, boy, preacher, you got a lot of people over there. Did you get your 300? I said, not yet. We have 299. We're one short. Got a question to ask you. Which one of you? <laughs> Which one of you will walk across the street and go to church with me this morning? Because whichever one of you goes across the street, you'll help us hit our 300 and you'll be the hero. And when people are having chicken dinner and are all across the farms today, they'll all be talking about you're the one that made it happen. Which one of the two of you wants to be the hero? Folks, you gotta ask the questions right. <laughs> Sandy and Glenn Harris looked at each other and they both looked at me and they said, look, we both want to be the hero. And he put a close sign on his gas station. I put one on one side, one on the other side. I walked back across that street. I walked right down. I mean, when I walked in that, in that church building, those farmers, I mean, they were looking, buddy. And they started clapping, throwing their hymn books in the area. I mean, they were having, I went down the front row, kicked two members off, set the two of them right down there. I taught. And I'm just a kid can't sleep that night. All, all I want to do is rehearse in my mind this incredible day of ministry for me. It was a, it was a big day for me. I know it doesn't sound big to you, but, but when I'm, you're a kid and it's the best you've ever done, it's big. And, and so I, I can't sleep. And I'm just going over and over. And I'm so excited. I'm so happy. And all of a sudden hit me in the middle of the night while I'm not sleeping. The only reason that we ever hit 300 was passion. Passion put us over the edge. Passion set us apart. Passion made the difference. Can I tell you something? When you're passionate about something, it isn't reasonable, but you do it anyway. When you're passionate about something, it's not possible, but you do it anyway. When you're passionate about something, passion will take you where nothing else will ever take you. It'll give you that decided edge. It'll help you to stand out. Wow. Now, let me just say something about purpose and dreams and finding your purpose. I wrote a book a few years ago called Put Your Dream to the Test. And basically, it's questions you need to ask yourself to make sure if your dream is a valid dream. And I would go around and I would teach off of this Put Your Dreams to the Test lesson. And, and all of a sudden, it hit me that there were a lot of people that didn't have their own dream. I, I had assumed when I wrote the book that everybody had a dream. I've had a dream. And all of a sudden, I realized there were people coming to me and said, well, I, I don't have a dream for myself. And I could see that they were a little lost, and all of a sudden, it hit me. And this is what I want you to understand. You may not have your own big dream for you, but it is probably because God has someone for you that he wants you to join and help them fulfill their dream. You see, this is a biblical principle. Not everybody has their own purpose and own personal dream. Look at, the, look, at, hey, look at the fishermen down at the Sea of Galilee when Jesus walked into their life and said, hey guys, follow me. I'm gonna make you fishers of men. What did he do? When he walked into their life, he gave them a dream that they didn't have. He gave them a cause that they didn't have. He gave them a person to hang around with that they didn't have. And let me tell you something. Sometimes God has people literally designed to come along and complement each other so that the dream can be filled. Teamwork makes the dream work. I've seen it happen many, many times. I can tell you right now, for many of you, it's happened in this church. You found this church, you found this place, this place of grace, this oasis, this place of vision, this place that is making a difference, this dynamic place. And all of a sudden, you started pouring your gifts in here, your, your spiritual gifts, your, your financial gifts. You just kind of, kind of lost yourself and just dove into this congregation. And now you're seeing amazing things happening. And it's an absolute fact that some of you, 
Your place, your purpose, your dream is to come alongside, compliment, add value, and do something for someone that they cannot do for themselves. Every great person is great because people have come around and supported that dream and supported that vision. Look at Jonathan and David in the Old Testament. Jonathan rightfully was going to be the next king. His father Saul was the king. He was the rightful heir, but when he saw David, he said, no, 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 David is the anointed one. I'm gonna back up. I'm not gonna be the king of Israel. I'm gonna support David. I'm gonna let him be the king of Israel. I'm going to be a king maker. And, and Jonathan understood that whole poss possibility of putting his purpose into the purpose of someone else. In my second church in Lancaster, Ohio, I can still remember the church was growing very fast. Good things were happening. One day I had an appointment with a, with a, with a, with a, a member of the church that wasn't an outstanding member, would not be termed a leader, would not be one of the people kind of, kind of that makes it happen. His name was Brent and he wanted to see me and so we sat down and, and I said, Brent, I said, what can I do for you? And he said, Pastor, he said, you, you, nothing, nothing. He said, there's something I can do for you. And I thought, well, this is interesting. So I kind of said, okay, what, what do you got? He said, well, he said, I'm watching the church grow and he said, I'm, I'm watching wonderful things happen in this church. And he, rec he said, I recognize I'm not, I'm not the top leader. I recognize that there are other people kind of that are more VIP than me. And I understand that. And he said, I, I just want you to know, I've been asking God, how can I help you? How can I add value to you? And he said, I know you're busy. And he said, I, I, I came across a God idea last week. He said, I said, what is it, Brett? He said, he said, I know you're busy. And he said, I know you have to do errands and chores like anyone else. And I thought, what would happen if I would give you every Thursday afternoon and do your errands for you? He said, I, I don't work on Thursday. I get done at noon and... If I could come by the office and you could have somebody just give me, you know, you got dry clean you want to do, you want your car clean, whatever you want to do. He said, you just, you just make a list and, 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 and let me just give you my Thursday afternoons. And for the next seven years, for the next seven years, Brent Johnson would come by the office around noon and Thursday and, and he would pick up all this stuff and he just began to lift a load. And, and I, I remember that day looking at this precious friend and hugging him. He became a very close friend, a very intimate friend of mine. Because he understood that, that his purpose was to help a bigger purpose and his dream was to add value to another dream. And I'm here to tell you, there are a whole bunch of you out there. You're adding value to the dream of this church. You're adding value to the, to the dream of somebody that you're working with. You're making a difference. So your purpose may not be just for personal use. It may be for corporate use or collective use. It may be bigger than you. Does that make sense? Passion. But the second question we ask ourselves is not only what am I passionate about, but what are my strengths? What am I good at? What is my spiritual giftedness? Because when God created you, he gave you gifts, spiritual strengths, to enable you to find and fulfill your purpose. And here's what I know, that when, when you find your spiritual gift, you'll be good at it. You really will be. It'll be just what you do well. It'll fit. It'll be natural. It'll be easy. You'll have an opportunity to use it. When you find your spiritual gift, God's going to give you the opportunity to use it. He's not going to give you a gift and then not let you have the opportunity to use it for others. You'll be energized by it. When you find your spiritual gift, all of a sudden it'll give you an energy that, that you just didn't, I mean, you, you'll, 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 just, you'll just love it. You'll just love it. You won't wear out. Can I tell you something? When you're in the area of your weaknesses, you get tired, don't you? But when you're in the area of your strengths, you're energized. I have a degree in counseling, so when I started the ministry, I started counseling. The good news is I had a degree, the bad news is I wasn't any good. <laughs> and I know you're thinking I'm modest, but I'm not modest. I wasn't any good, trust me. People would come into me for counseling and I'm kind of a bottom line person. They'd start talking to me about their problem and I'd very quickly figure out what it was. And I got my legal pad and I'm already giving them a kind of a one, two, three way to fix their problem. And so I'd kind of write it down for them and I'd tear the sheet off and hand it to them and say, be healed. <laughs> and they come back the next month with another problem. I thought, D didn't we fix you last month? <laughs> and so, well, I got another problem. And so I'd listen to that when I'd give them two or three points and tear off the page and be healed. And it kept coming back. and. I kept getting worn out. I'd come home, I'd be tired. I said, Margaret, I don't have any energy. I'm just dealing with problems and weaknesses. And, and, and then I'd get irritable and I'd get impatient. And, 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 and then sometimes they'd be so discouraged to say, I just, I just would like to jump off the bridge. And 
I found myself offering to drive them to the bridge. <laughs> That's not a good thing for a counselor to do. And then sometimes I'd take them to where the bridge was and I'd be so discouraged by the time I got to the bridge, I'd just say, could we hold hands and do kumbaya and jump off together, you know what I mean? Whee! Oh, well, here we go. No energy. It was my weakness. I wasn't dealing in, out of my strengths. And one day I realized that when I counseled with people, I worked with their weaknesses and I wasn't good at that. But when I equipped people, I worked with their strengths. And all of a sudden it was like, I mean, a light, I mean literally within, within a matter of a couple of days, I went from being worn out because I was working with weaknesses to be absolutely energized because I started working with people's strengths and started equipping them. And all of a sudden I began to understand what happens when you play to your strength zone, when you play in the areas where you're good at. And I would also say when you find your spiritual gifts, you'll have capacity to develop them. You, you, you'll, get, you'll really get good. You're good now, but once you start developing and working your spiritual gifts, you really get good. I was excited when Chris was talking earlier and sharing with those in the legacy area, people with the gift of giving. And, and, and would encourage you, if you got that gift, you know, there's a meeting tonight, grace to come. I know what he's doing. He's going to help you with the gift of giving to take that gift that is a wonderful gift and he's going to help you to absolutely highlight it because you have capacity there that, that you've never understood or never tapped. I would encourage you, if that's where your gift is, don't miss that meeting tonight. So that, now that's how we find our purpose, by our passion and by our, our giftedness. So then how do we lose ourselves? We lose ourselves because we give, we lose ourselves when we give our purpose to something bigger than us. When, when all of a sudden we say, okay, I, I've got to give myself to something bigger than me. Jesus said it. What he said? He said, you'll lose your life. He said, you'll lose your life when you follow me and when you give it for the sake of the gospel. When you, when you, when you, when you take your purpose and position it in, a, in something bigger than you, he said, all of a sudden you'll begin to lose yourself. So for your notes, when you're bigger than your purpose... When you and I, when we're bigger than our purpose, we have a career. I deal in the marketplace all the time in leadership. And I deal all the time with people that have careers, and most of them, they're bigger than their career. They, they, they've got a career, but it's always looking out for me and, and how am I going to advance and how am I going to achieve. And it, they're, they're, bigger than, they're, they're, bi they're bigger than their purpose, and so they have a career. But can I tell you something? When your purpose is bigger than you, you have a calling. And losing yourself is when you get a calling. And it's a calling because now it, it's no longer just you. It's, it's more than you. It's bigger than you. In my own little journey, I've had four steps to this, what I would call losing myself with my purpose journey. It started out with, I want to make a difference. As a young person, I just wanted to make a difference, just like every one of you. Every one of you in this auditorium today, I can promise you, if I could come in and sit beside you, and you and I could have a conversation, every one of you would say, John, I'd like to make a difference in my life. I'd like to do something that really, really matters. That's how my journey began. I want to make a difference. And then one day I realized I had to go beyond that. There was another step, and I went from, I want to make a difference, to step two. I want to make a difference doing something that makes a difference. This is now I'm going to begin to lose myself. I'm going to begin to lose myself because now I'm focusing on doing something in my life that has eternal value. I'm gonna do something in my life that, that is bigger than me, that lives beyond me, that, 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 that can never be satisfied or fulfilled or achieved by me. I wanna make a difference doing something that makes a difference. I'm, I'm, now, I'm now beginning to lose myself. And then I went to step three. I want to make a difference doing something that makes a difference with people who make a difference. Because I realized all of a sudden that the big things in life, the great things in life, take a team. One is too small of a number to achieve greatness. And if you're going to do something amazing, it's going to be because you do it with other people. And again, that's what makes this congregation so vibrant. This is what makes this congregation so incredibly relevant today. You're doing it together. You're, you're, you're loving together, praying together, worshiping together, ministering together. You, 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 
You're not diving alone, you're diving together. I wanna make a difference, doing something that makes a difference with people that make a difference. And then because of my age at 66, because time is important and every day I'm counting my days, I have to count my days. There's a fourth part for me. I wanna make a difference doing something that makes a difference with people that make a difference at a time when it makes a difference. Gotta make it count. I don't get many more do-it-overs. Gotta make sure that I do it right on the front end. I was, for several years I go to the Indianapolis 500, Tony George who owned all that and, and, and was over that race, read all my books. And, and he would have me come in on race day and, and, and talk to the drivers, the owners, and, and, and then we'd go up to his suite and we'd watch the Indianapolis 500. We were having lunch before the race one day and Tony looked at me across the table and he said, John, what's the difference between success and significance? I said, oh, Tony, success is when I add value to myself. And significance is when I add value to others. And you lose yourself not in success. You find yourself in success. You lose yourself in significance. It's when we begin to add value to others that we begin to lose ourselves because now the cause is greater. Our why, our purpose, our why is bigger than us. And when our why is bigger than us, when you find your why, you'll find your way. Everything changes at that time. I shared with you earlier that I'm 66, so people ask me all the time, they say, John, when are you gonna retire? And I tell them I'm not gonna retire. And they look at me and say, well, why not? You can, of course I can. I'm old enough to retire. I have enough money to retire. I've, I've been very blessed, I'm very grateful. I mean, I've written 25 million books and sold them. I, that's, just do the math, I'm gonna be okay financially. Well then, John, John, let me ask you, why, why, don't, you, why don't you retire? I, I, I'm not gonna retire because, because I've lost my way. My, my purpose is greater than me. I, I have a calling, not a career. I, a career you win, a career you kind of phase out. And there's all kinds of things you do with the career, but with the calling, I mean, I, what I do is, is what I love to do and, and I don't want to retire. I don't have any desire to retire. I, I, I didn't come to Birmingham because I wanted another plane trip. I didn't come to Birmingham because I wanted to see Birmingham. I've seen Birmingham. I came to Birmingham because I wanted to see you. And I wanted to see you because I thought I had a message perhaps that could help you find your purpose and maybe spark something within you that would begin to get you on your way to, to finding and losing your purpose. That, that's why I came. I'm having the time of my life. I tweeted my wife, Margaret, before I went out. I said, oh, this is what I was born for. I was born for this. And if I was born for this, why would I want to stop? I've decided that I'm going to live until I die. And I've decided I'm not gonna get those two confused. Because a lot of people do. So some people say, when are you gonna retire? I don't tell you when I'm gonna retire. I'm gonna retire when I die. When I die, I am retiring. I'm gonna make it official. When I'm dead, I am writing no more books. I'm not writing any more books, I kid you not. And when I'm dead, I, 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 I don't care how many times Chris asks me when I'm dead, I'm not coming back. I'm not coming, but I'm gonna tell you, until uh, I die, I think I'll live. And I think I'll live because I have a passion for what I do and I have a purpose for what I do and I've found my purpose and I've lost my purpose and I've lost my purpose in you. Every time you put yourself into someone else, everything changes. I wish my dad were here today. He's still in great health. He's 92. He's amazing. You say, what do you mean he's amazing? I'm, he's amazing. He's the greatest man I know. A few years ago, my mother died. They'd been married for 66 years. When she died, even though he was in good health, my brother and sister and I, we said, Dad, let's get, a, let's get you in a kind of retirement community and so that you have support around you, people around you. And they were just building one close to his home, and so he said, okay. And so we took him over and got him all ready in the whole process. And, and one day I was having lunch with him. He said, son, he said, you know that when, when, they, when they open the retirement community, they've said I could be the first one to move in. I said, Dad, that's great. I said, uh, why do you want to be the first one to move in? Well, he said, son, there's a bunch of old people going to come here. <laughs> and he said, those old people, he said, they're nervous and they're insecure and they've never been away from home. And 
He said, they need somebody here to encourage them. And he said, I want to be the first one. I want to be right at the front door. So when they come into the, into the community, I can shake their hand and say, my name's Melvin Maxwell. I just want you to know I'm your friend. and It's going to be okay. And we're going to have a good time here. He said, they need somebody to help them. That's what he did. And that's what he does. That's what he's doing. In fact, while I'm teaching here, he's become the chaplain of that place. They didn't vote him in, he just raised his hand and elected himself. <laughs> Found a nice big empty kind of hall there and meeting room in the, their facility and asked him if he could have church there and so he had a first service and he filled it up. And so he got a second service and he's got it full now. Recently we were having lunch, he said, son, he said, we're full. He said, I, I, we've got a real problem. We've got a real challenge. He said, we're full in the first service. We're full in the second service. He said, I'm looking into satellite now. I'm, I'm, looking into, I, I, I'm looking into satellite. He's 92, and he's looking into satellite. He's 92. He's looking into satellite. He's found his purpose. He's lost in his purpose. It's absolutely incredible. I have a coaching company. <laughs> and we had met several hundred of our coaches to, for training a, a few weeks ago and I was having dinner with him. Before I went over to Orlando for the coaching conference, I said, Dad, on, on, on Sunday I'm gonna speak. And I said, would you mind coming over and speaking a little bit? And he said, well, son, he said, I'd love to come over and speak to those coaches. He said, they need some encouragement. But he said, you know, I've got two services. I said, with that, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll get the limo driver to pick you up and we'll have an early one. We'll, we'll have you speak at 8 o'clock and you can be done at 8.30 and you can get back because your first service is at 9 and your next service is at 11. He said, oh, he said, that'll be wonderful. And he said, he looked at Betty as he just got him a brand new kind of wife and boy, he's just so happy with her and she take care. She's an 82-year-old chick, okay? And, and, and he's so happy with her and he says, oh, honey, he said, it's going to be wonderful. He says, I'll get to do three services on Sunday. He's 92. He's 92. He's found his purpose. And that's what I want for you. That's why I came here. I came because this morning when you woke up, God had thoughts about you. Yes, he did. This morning when you woke up, he said, I got a plan for them. I got, I got a plan. Today, God's thinking about you. Today, God has a plan for you. You are special, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. God is thinking about you and has a plan for you right now. Yeah, he does. Close your eyes, please. In a moment, I'm gonna turn it back over to Lane, but before I do, there are literally dozens and dozens of you that you're here and you're hearing about purpose and a plan that's bigger than you, a God that has thoughts and plans for you. And I know where you are. You're sitting here and you're saying, I, I, I don't even know God. I've got wonderful news for you. The greatest purpose and plan God has for you is to know him. And he sent his son Jesus Christ into this world to die for your sins. And he has a wonderful gift, a gift of forgiveness for every one of you. With every head out bowed and every eye closed, I wonder how many of you, in just a minute, I'm just gonna ask you in your seats, you don't have to get up, you don't have to come forward. But in just a moment, I'm gonna ask every one of you that would love to know God and love to, to plug into his plan for your life. And you're saying, I, I, I'm kind of wondering, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little bit out there, and, but today I'm catching it. I'm starting to catch it. Don't understand everything, but here's what I know. God loves me, God thinks about me, God has a plan for me. And you'd like to know God. And you'd love to have your sins forgiven and love to have Christ as your savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I wonder how many of you across the auditorium would raise your hand right now and say, hey, John, I want to plug into God like I've never plugged into him before. I want to know him like I've never known him before. I want to meet God because I know he has a plan for me, and I want to find him 
and I want to find his plan for my life. And you raise your hand over the auditorium right now. Many of you are raising your hands right now. Yeah, dozens, dozens of you. Just raise them up. Just keep them up for me real, real high, just so I can see. Just, just, just you and me. I, I'm just the only one looking. I, I'm going to guess there are 100, 150 hands raised right now. You may put your hands down, but if you, if you raise your hands a moment ago, just look up at me, would you please? Yeah, those that raise your hand, just look up at me. I'm going to pray with you now. And I want you in your heart to pray with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I am sorry for my sins, and I know that you have a plan for my life, which includes forgiving me of my sins and allow me to become your child. And so I give myself to you today. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my life as my savior, as my friend, as my eternal companion. And from this day forward, I'm going to start a new life. I've got a new page. This is a new beginning, a new step. From this day forward, I'm going to serve you and I'm going to live for you. And then I pray in closing for everyone here on all of the campuses. If they're watching just now, God, help them to understand that you value them in such a way that you're thinking about them, you have a plan for them. And we want to find it. And once we find it, we want to give it right back to you in a cause that is bigger than us so that we could lose it. We want to find ourselves so we could lose ourselves. So as we lose ourselves, we can find ourselves. So today I'm asking in closing that every person here will begin to seek, to know, and discover your purpose for your life. In your name I pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.